Hello and welcome to class. Class has been certified clean by the U.S. Track and Field Anti-Doping Agency. So, anyway, um, before we begin today, I want to, uh, you know, kind of have a little bit of overview. And this is uh, courtesy if we could go to the web page of. Uh, uh, one of my favorite publications. So, just kind of to review what we've learned so far: the top U.S. foreign policy blunders, and uh, I like the 1997 one, of course, best of all, when the CIA ordered Princess Di taken down with extreme prejudice. So, anyway, this is from the Onion, which uh, I don't know if you've seen it. Uh, has been really good lately on Reagan and things like that. Anyway. Um, I used to do those on my own, but then I'm not just I'm just not that creative anymore. So it's just easier to steal other people's stuff. Anyway, um, we want to continue and try to very quickly go through what we're to today. Uh, the war took a long time, and you could teach whole courses on it. I've done that, but I'm going to try to speed through it. I think I said this last week and got to like 1941, right? So anyway, we'll try to to blow through it as fast as we can. Um, talked a little bit last week about the preparations for war, uh, uh, the war. And uh, um, the attendant reindustrialization at home actually gets the U.S. out of a depression. And this also uh, encourages um, uh, Roosevelt to look larger in the larger sense and see World War II, this global conflict, as an opportunity to expand American interest. And you've already seen that. We talked last week about things like the uh, uh, Article 7 of Lend-Lease. What did Article 7 do at Lend-Lease, remember? Then least was to give supplies, right, to the Allies to help them fight. But what's really important in there is that Article 7. What did that say? Free trade. Free trade. They had to open up their trading areas. Uh, the Atlantic Charter, free trade, right? So America's global goals are this, you know, of course, what we've said before, the open door. That's our mantra here. It's kind of a dead horse, right? Uh, and, and so the war presents an opportunity for that because what's the real fear of Germany and Japan beyond the aggression? It's, it's their closed economic systems, economic nationalism, autarky. You see these words thrown around. Uh, all the time. At the same time, Germany's aggression has gone on uh, very strong, uh, strongly, unabated through 1940. Uh, uh, you know, remember in the 30s, the stuff we've already talked about, Austria, Czechoslovakia, everything else. And then, you know, the, uh, the invasion of Poland, which more or less triggers the official outbreak of the war. The invasion of France, which terrifies the West because France was supposed to be, you know, uh, able to, to withstand uh, German pressure. It had the Maginot Line, and the Germans just cut through it. And then the Battle of Britain, which which is really horrific. It's the most intense air war in history up to that point. But ultimately, it's it's uh, his first, uh, it's Hitler's first um, uh, failure, first setback. Okay, uh, at that point, um, German aggression in general is starting to be slowed, and this is 1941. Uh, in addition to the Battle of Britain, uh, the Germans had to send troops in uh, to Italy. Uh, remember, Mussolini and Hitler were allies. The Axis was Rome, Berlin, and Tokyo. Italy, Germany, and Japan. Uh, Mussolini was a bad ally. It was was a real blunder. It was one of one of Hitler's. He created several blunders. Uh, one thing about these guys, like you know Hitler or Saddam Hussein, who kind of have this this super villain image, is they're really quite incompetent in a lot of ways. And Hitler blundered quite a bit. Um, and in '41, you can see that he 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 creates this alliance with Italy, which becomes you know a lot of baggage. Actually, he's constantly kind of pulling Italy's chestnuts out of the fire. Uh, uh, Mussolini had invaded Greece and had begun a North African campaign, but in both of those cases, Hitler had to come to the Italian rescue uh, in Greece. I mean, they couldn't even subdue the Greeks. Uh, uh, if you've seen what's that movie? What, you know, uh, the book. I mean, Corelli's Mandolin is actually set set on this. Uh, and then, uh, uh, so the Germans had to come into Greece and actually kind of uh, subdue uh, uh, that country. In addition to that, um, Hitler had to send his tank, his major tank commander, his number one tank commander, Erwin Rommel, into North Africa. So uh, in both of these cases, um, uh, the Germans have to bail out the Italians. I don't know if I told you the story last week. It's my favorite. But during World War II, the Italians traveled uh, uh, not only with their military equipment, with, with lots of food and wine. I mean, they really ate well. And, and you know, in the latter stages of the uh, North African campaign, rather than get rid of the pasta and wine, they actually ditched material. They ditched equipment and ammunition so they could keep the, uh, the spaghetti and the, uh, and the vino, which I think is the sign of a really advanced culture. So it's really, yeah. Quite, quite proud of that. All right, so so Hitler already has this this baggage, you know, this this albatross around his neck with Mussolini, but then he commits an even graver blunder in mid June 1941, which we briefly mentioned last week, when he invades um, 
the Soviet Union in Operation Barbarossa. A week prior to that, the Soviet Union and the Germans had actually concluded a pact, the foreign ministers, Vyacheslav Molotov and Joachim Ribbentrop, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, in which they agreed that they would not fight again, I'm sorry, two years earlier they conducted a, concluded a pact right before the invasion of Poland in which they had agreed that they would not fight against each other and they would carve up Poland as part of that. In June of 1941, Hitler violates this agreement and invades the Soviet Union in uh, Operation Barbarossa. Uh, the initial attacks were quite impressive. Um, German tanks, panzer divisions broke through uh, the Russian lines, uh, the lift Waffe, the German Air Force, knocked out airfields and planes. Uh, Stalin was advised by all his military uh, 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 people, his generals, to do a tactical retreat, to withdraw, to you know, withdraw and regroup. He refused to do that. Um, the build-up to the the, the uh, Eastern invasion is really, you know, really interesting. The whole Eastern Front, World War II, is really fascinating. If you're into military history, there's some great books on this, and it's really interesting stuff because it's by far the biggest war in history, and just staggering the the, the numbers involved. Uh, but but um, in, the, in the period prior to World War II, you know, Stalin, you've all heard stories about his paranoia and his brutal, bloody, ruthless ways. He had uh, essentially wiped out the Red Army officer corps. He thought they were all plotting against them. So he either exiled or executed something like eight to 12,000 officers. In addition to that, his intelligence, you know, his, his spies came back in June and said, there's like hundreds of German troops coming toward us. He discounted all this. He had exiled or, or killed off his military leadership. So when the invasion actually begins, he's really befuddled. You know, the people there say, you know, you need to retreat. He refuses. Uh, you know, the kind of psycho history suggests that he kind of had some kind of a breakdown for a few months. But it's really a, a, a traumatic error, really disastrous. Uh, ultimately, it's going to be Hitler's biggest error, even far more than, than, than anything else. But uh, uh, the invasion of the Soviet Union ultimately is going to be, you know, the, the real nail in the coffin of the Germans. And, and this is ultimately, you know, really why uh, they fail uh, in their grand designs and, and World War II. Uh, however, the initial stages, as I said, do go well. Uh, in June, the Germans break through and, and make uh, rapid advances. This is not the best map. It was kind of hard to come up with something better. But you can just kind of see from the arrows, you know, what a rapid advance this is into uh, into uh, the Soviet Union uh, uh, to, to the um, to the east. Uh, by October of 41, Germany was near Moscow and Leningrad, capital city. Uh, Soviet despair was quite high. Um, Stalin got it together. Germany started to lose steam. A major problem throughout the war for the Germans was they had outpaced their logistics lines. You know what logistics are? It's your supplies, it's your communications, it's the way you get your, your food and your oil and everything else. Germans advance, the German advance had been so rapid that they had actually outpaced their lines, so they had to stop. In addition to that, in October, much of Russia was underdeveloped, so a lot of the roads were, were actually, you know, dirt. And heavy rains came, which turned them into mud, which also slowed the Germans down. Uh, by by November, the Germans had resumed their offensive. At that point, um, this is when kind of Stalin starts to get it together. Uh, his tank commander, main tank commander, guy who would really kind of win the war for him was uh, Marshal Zhukov. And uh, uh, Zhukov was a brilliant tactician, a brilliant military commander up there, you know, really with the best of the war. And, and, and uh, uh, the Russian uh, tank divisions were able to kind of finally stop the Germans. In addition to that, uh, again, weather played a role. There was a bitter, brutal winter with temperatures well below zero let alone below freezing. Uh, the Germans had invaded in June when it was summer in cotton clothing. Uh, they, you know, as I said, they were having logistics problems. So a lot of these guys are fighting in this incredibly brutal, bitter cold, and, you know, literally freezing and freezing to death even. So uh, um, by, uh, uh, by November, December, you start to see the Germans slow down. The Germans did seize the Ukraine, a very uh, vital area for agriculture. Uh, they were close to Moscow. They laid siege to uh, Leningrad, uh, which ultimately would lead to over a million people dead. There was a movie about it a couple years ago, I believe, wasn't there? The, the Siege of Leningrad, I can't remember. I think Jude Law or somebody was in it. Um, so it's, it's like really one of the kind of signal uh, 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 events of World War II. Uh, however, at that point, the Soviets rally. Um, the new leaders who had replaced those who Stalin had executed or exiled kind of come in. They stabilized the situation. Uh, the Soviet Union shifted whole factories 
across the Urals and into Siberia. As factories were being threatened, they would literally, I mean, human labor, actually pick up, you know, dismember the entire factory, put it on rail lines, move it across the Ural Mountain Range or into Siberia, and, and, and reconstruct it there, you know, just staggering uh, uh, human labor. Um, they expanded production of tanks and airplanes and artillery, uh, and, and U.S. and Soviet production, as I said before, was just vital, really critical. By 41, it's starting to kick in. By 42, 43, this is really what's decisive, because there's no way Germany can match the production of the United States alone, and the Soviet Union, uh, especially in tank production, is staggering too, so, so Germany is just getting kind of ground down, ultimately. Um, by early December, the German uh, offensive is more or less blunted, uh, so, uh, and, and then of course Pearl Harbor occurs, so you have kind of the official uh, lineup in, in the war. You have the, uh, the, uh, uh, the British, the Americans, the Russians on one side against the Axis, the Italians, the uh, Germans, and the Japanese. Uh, at that point, the alliance, the, the Axis, of course, is the enemy. The, the Americans, British, and uh, uh, Soviets are going to be referred to as the alliance. So they get together, and they have to kind of, uh, uh, kind of figure out how to fight the war. Now, these are real, there's some real issues between them, and, and, and any time you have allies in warfare, in general, you're going to have some conflict and tension, and, and World War II is certainly no exception to that. It's an alliance of necessity. Um, the British and the Americans, you know, they get along fairly well, but uh, until uh, uh, Hitler invaded the Soviet Union, you know, they were, the Soviet Union was despised. Uh, Churchill said, if Hitler invaded hell, I would make a favorable reference to Satan. You know, basically his point was, I hate Stalin, I despise him, he's Satan, but Hitler's a graver threat, so we'll help the Soviet Union. So it's not exactly, you know, an alliance where people, you know, have common goals. In fact, they have quite different ideas um, about, uh, about what they want. Uh, for the Soviet Soviet Union, uh, the major goal is going to be security uh, because they've been invaded now in both 1914 and 1941, both times by the Germans, both times through the Polish corridor. So uh, Stalin wants to use the war to uh, make sure this doesn't happen again. How do you do that? You simply crush Germany and you make sure that you have a post-war settlement in which they can't rise up. It's actually not at all dissimilar to what France wants. Uh, Britain's goal is to maintain the empire as much as possible. They see the writing on the wall. I mean, Lend-Lease and the Atlantic Charter are indications that the U.S. wants to use its economic power to break open the British Empire, to break open the Sterling Block. Uh, area. Uh, nonetheless, they want to hold on uh, to as much uh, of that as, uh, as possible. Um, and for the U.S., of course, it's trade. It's, it's, it's open, uh, uh, the open door uh, world. So um, there's a real difference here then uh, in, in how they see the world and what they, they want uh, to get out of uh, participation in this major conflict. Obviously, the first goal is to, be, to, to defeat Germany. And after that, there's really all kinds of conflicting ideas and conflicting uh, goals. Um, once the war begins, the Americans and the British get together and they have to decide on a strategy. Overall, it's going to be a European war. That's most important. Even though the immediate precipitous cause is going to be in the Pacific, the attack on Pearl Harbor, Europe is far more important, and it always will be. Uh, the U.S. wants to maintain the integrity of Europe, which is a far more important region in terms of global trade and global commerce. Asia, more kind of a prospective or potential area. Europe already set. Um, so uh, the U.S. and the British agree on a Europe first uh, approach. Uh, they want to maintain the integrity of Europe. They want to maintain the open door, which is a key to world prosperity. Asia is important, Japan and China are important, but more kind of as potential areas. Europe is already set. There is, as I said though, a great undercurrent of discontent within this alliance. The three powers have different and sometimes competing uh, uh, goals, uh, and that division was apparent immediately, especially on what I would argue is the most important issue of the war with regard to the alliance and international politics, and it carries over into the post-war period and is, I think, a major factor in the Cold War, and that's the establishment of a second front. Okay. Um, let me see what uh, map I have up here. Uh, they're all about the same, right? Um, the, the Soviet Union's in, you know, getting attacked here in the east, all right? Um, you're Joe Stalin, you have 200 German divisions slugging it out with you, right? What if you're Stalin? What if you're a Soviet leader? Uh, do you want to see happen to kind of alleviate your situation? Reduction of troop 
You want a reduction in the enemy's troop force. How do you do that? Western Front. You establish another theater, another area of operations on the western part of Europe. And in that way, the Germans will have no choice but to draw off a bunch of their divisions which are fighting against the Soviet Union and then slug it out in the west. So Stalin and, and anybody, you know, anybody in the world will want, you know, to be relieved. You know, you want a second front. So the Soviet Union immediately, as soon as the, the alliance is set, says we need a second front established in 1942 in order to draw off of the German offensive in the east. It's just is really simple. Um, and, and even though the Soviets had blunted the German offensive in 41, that by no means indicates that Germany is dead and they're reeling. Uh, they have a lot of resources. Remember, they had captured pretty much all of uh, uh, Central Europe. And so they have, you know, all the resources of Central Europe, which increases their production capacities. In addition to that, as they conquer areas, they uh, impress those soldiers into the, the Nazi army too. So they're fighting not only with German troops, but with Italian troops and Romanian troops and Hungarian Hungarian troops and others who are now part of, of this German invasion. So, you know, the Germans aren't dead by, by any means. Uh, uh, Germany, in fact, in 1942 still has visions not only of the Ukraine, which, you know, it has already gained a great foothold in because of the agriculture, but also the, the Caucasus region, which uh, is right here, actually. I don't know if you can see it. But the Caucasus is really important because, anybody know why, what the Caucasus has? Oil, oil rich area. So, um, in addition to that, uh, uh, the Mediterranean is an area of, of operations, of heavy operations. Um, you have the, the Desert War in Northern Africa with Rommel, although the British do stop him at El Alamein. Uh, uh, and then in 1943, North Africa is basically liberated. I'm, as I said, I'm going through this, this rather quickly. All right, so there's a lot going on, but from Stalin's perspective, North Africa and, and the Mediterranean and, and um, you know, uh, Central Europe, all these are secondary. The major strategic goal has to be the establishment of a major second front in the West, which means in, in France, okay? Uh, uh, so uh, uh, this is going to be a major problem. The Soviet Union was getting bled in the East. I mean, just the, 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 uh, the, the toll is staggering. The numbers are incredible of, of German and Soviet dead. And Stalin believes, with good reason, that, that the West was letting the Germans and Soviets bleed each other to death. In fact, Churchill didn't really hide that. Churchill was quite kind of candid in that he wanted Germany and the Soviet Union to essentially crush each other. Uh, uh, in 1941, a, a senator in the United States from Missouri on the floor of the Senate said, if the Germans are winning, we should support the Soviets. And if the Soviets are winning, we should support the Germans. And in that way, they could kill each other off. Okay? Anybody know who that senator from Missouri was? Truman. Harry Truman. Yeah, this was his analysis, right? Let's support whoever's losing at the time so they can all kill each other off. Um, However, uh, uh, other Americans understood, especially people in the military, that, that Stalin uh, uh, really had a legitimate cause in the Second Front. And that from American interest that, that a Second Front was vital to, one American officer said, uh, if we are to keep Russia in, save the Middle East, India, and Burma, we've got to begin slugging it out with air in Western Europe and to be followed by a land attack as soon as possible in order to keep Russia in the war and also to have American interests served. Why would American interests be served by having a second front established? Because the Americans would then have a foothold in Europe. It's important if you're going to fight a war, you need to actually fight it. You need to be involved and engaged in defeating the enemy. Because if the Russians went all by themselves, then the Americans are kind of left out. Okay? Uh, Roosevelt in 1942 told um, the Soviet foreign minister, Molotov, to, to tell Stalin that we're going to set up a front, expect a second front in 1942. The Americans were, were, were in agreement with the, uh, the Soviets uh, on this point, that a, that a second front should be established um, as soon as possible. Roosevelt, in fact, even says in 1942, and this is from a transcript of, of a meeting, of a cabinet meeting, uh, it said, the president realizes that the Russian armies are killing more Axis personnel and destroying more Axis material 
than all other 25 United Nations put together. So Roosevelt understands that, that right now the Soviet Union is taking on the German army uh, single-handedly. Uh, the British have a different vision here, though. Uh, the British uh, are far more concerned with uh, um, this area here, the Balkans, all right, and, uh, and southern Europe. Um, the United States, uh, and Churchill always said, Churchill called this the soft underbelly approach. I think somebody asked about that last week. Churchill's idea was if you go out through the Mediterranean and attack Germany, that way they're more vulnerable than if you take them head on in Western Europe. So, so Churchill's suggestion was to go through the Mediterranean into the Balkans and attack Germany from the south, kind of a, a northward uh, a thrust. Um, the Americans, however, didn't believe that. They believed that Churchill's concern was to maintain uh, commercial lines of transport through the Mediterranean to maintain imperial lines of transport because what does the Mediterranean ultimately lead to what big area where Germany and where the British have a colony and a whole lot of interest in the Middle East you should know this Egypt, Egypt. Suez right right so um, uh, uh, so uh, the Americans and the British see this quite differently. American military commanders were all in favor of a second front because the U.S. goal was to be in Central Europe, in Germany, when the war ended. Uh, the British basically um, monkey wrenched the whole thing. They pushed for this alternative attack, the... the, uh, the um, uh, a soft underbelly approach, and Roosevelt finally went along with it. This was called Operation Torch, and it takes place in uh, 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 beginning at 42. I think this is the map of Torch. Yeah, um, those blue arrows. That's a real simple map, which I think is actually better. But those blue arrows indicate uh, uh, Operation Torch. It begins in November of 1942, and and the goal here is to liberate uh, North Africa. This will eventually lead to campaigns, which we'll talk briefly about later, in Sicily and then in in Italy. As a result of Torch and the Sicilian and Italian campaigns, what do you think happens to the Second Front? It's continually delayed, postponed, canceled. Uh, when uh, uh, Roosevelt agrees to torch in lieu of a second front, Eisenhower, the Supreme Commander, uh, Dwight Eisenhower of the uh, uh, American forces, of the Allied forces, I'm sorry, in, uh, in uh, Europe, Eisenhower was furious. And he said, it will be the blackest day in history if uh, Russia leaves the war. There's a real fear that Russia's going to get defeated or just give up, you know, like they did in World War I, right? So this is a great fear. It's going to be horrible for us if we continue to kind of, you know, take our time and delay and stall. And as a result of that, the Russians uh, bail out. In fact, American and British officials several times almost came to blows uh, over the second front, over many issues, actually. The, 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 the alliance between the Americans and British was quite testy. Uh, throughout this entire period. Um, Britain got its way in 42 and 43, uh, however. Uh, Britain was already mobilized, it was already on the continent, and the Americans uh, weren't. So uh, they had a great uh, a advantage there and were able to, uh, to uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, push torch, push these diversions on Roosevelt. Um, Churchill simply was uh, not willing to accept heavy losses in order to help the Soviet Union and at the same time not help his own imperial interests. Uh, an invasion of, of, uh, uh, of France doesn't help the British Empire. Clearing the Mediterranean of Axis shipping does help the Empire because they can continue to trade through the Mediterranean, which is a major trade route. Um, once American production and manpower really kicks in in 43, they have far more uh, juice in getting strategy made. But until then, the British have, have the upper hand. Um, so uh, uh, the Allies <laughs> forego a second front and begin <coughs> towards, I just showed you the map of that. Um, at the same time, there's also an invasion of Sicily. Um, uh, the goal there is, as I said, to clear the Mediterranean for Allied shipping, and then Churchill believed you go into take all of Italy. Uh, the U.S. was not uh, really uh, thrilled with this Italian campaign, believing that it would uh, endanger a second front, a cross-channel invasion, uh, and they were certainly right about that. Uh, the battle for Sicily began in the summer of 1943 and, and was very quick, barely lasted a month. Uh, at that point, Mussolini was actually deposed. 
announced uh, a new commander at Field Marshal Badoglio, open talks, took over open talks with the Allies and surrendered. Uh, the Italians handed over their Navy, their Air Force, and their Merchant Marines, and they joined the alliance against Germany. It's kind of weird, though, because the Germans sprung Mussolini and moved him to the north and actually set up another government. And so what you have is essentially a German government headed by Mussolini in Italy. So the Italians are fighting against the Germans in Italy. It's, it's kind of strange the way it, it uh, ends up uh, working out. Um, once the, the Sicilian campaign ends, like I said, it takes about a month. The, um, the uh, Allies begin uh, an invasion uh, of Italy, and again, this is a, a Churchill strategic goal because the Mediterranean is more important to him. Um, the U.S. wanted a very limited offensive of, it, of Italy to continue to work on the second front, but again, Churchill gets his way. The invasion of Italy, the battle for Italy in World War II, was brutal and bloody. I'm going through it very quickly, but it's, it's, it's really uh, dreadful if you read accounts of it. Um, it begins in 43, continues all the way through 1944. Uh, as German troops, as I said before, it's kind of where German troops are actually applying northern Italy, occupying northern Italy to defend against the Italians and, and the Allies. Uh, 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 and, you know, coming in to try to liberate uh, uh, the country. Uh, finally, in April of 1945, pretty much at the very end of the war, uh, the Germans surrendered uh, in Italy. Um, there's really not a whole lot of, of justification for the Italian campaign militarily. If you read military historians generally think that this was a, a, a dangerous and, and counterproductive diversion, that there really weren't strategic objectives in Italy worth the bloodshed, the losses, the time, uh, and the failure to establish a second front. Uh, uh, nonetheless, um, you know, this does create grave animosities between uh, uh, Stalin and the United States. States, which we'll talk about later. Uh, 1944 is a pretty good year, actually, in the West. You can kind of uh, see this. This is Allied gains um, in 1944. Um, but, you know, considering that the, the year began, and, and this actually takes into account D-Day, which we haven't talked about yet, but considering where the Germans were in 1940, uh, you know, which, you know, all this would have been part of their territory as well in the uh, West, uh, then, then um, you know, 44 becomes a, a fairly uh, productive year. Uh, uh, much of Italy is liberated. France ultimately is liberated. The Allies are well on their, their way to a, to a victory. And I would suggest, you know, later, when you have some time clicking on these maps, they're, they're useful to look at. At the same time that the situation in the West begins to look better, the war continues in the East. And this is really where the, uh, uh, the Germans are, are, are really uh, hit hard, where, where ultimately they're defeated. Um, Germany in 1943 suffered major losses uh, in Stalingrad and were forced to retreat from the Caucasus. So by 1943, Germany's kind of lost any hope of an offensive victory of actually going into the Soviet Union and winning and taking over there. Um, the Soviet Union, for one thing, is vast. It encompasses 11 time zones. In addition to that, the Red Army, especially its tank units, were very uh, tenacious. So the Soviet Union begins to repel these German attacks and begins to push them uh, backward. They're fighting a war of attrition with what are called defense in depth tactics. Defense in depth means what it says. You know, you defend your area with incredible numbers of soldiers and technology. With mine, you lay a, a huge, you know, field of defense down. Mine fields, artillery, anti-tank guns, and so forth. And you just lay down, you know, literally acres of this in order to prevent your enemy from uh, from uh, uh, taking the offensive. Uh, in the East, as I said earlier, these are the greatest land battles in warfare. I mean, they literally encompass in, in a single battle millions of troops, thousands of tanks, tens of thousands of artillery pieces. I think the biggest was at a place called Kursk, the Kursk Salient, K-U-R-S-K. Uh, uh, so uh, Russia is grinding down the Germans and they begin to really feel this manpower shortage. Uh, uh, Germany, even with the Central Europeans, can't match you know, the, 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 just the scope, the size of the Soviet Union. And then, of course, with American industrial production, it's just you know, uh, overwhelmed. As a result of that, you start to see the Red Army push the uh, Germans out of the eastern uh, areas. Uh, they move into southeast Poland 
in uh, 1944 and lift the siege at Leningrad. Uh, they swept into Romania in the so-called mud offensive of uh, the spring of 44. By mid-44, the Soviet Union held a four to one manpower advantage and a six to one advantage in armor. Uh, and they drove the last Germans off of Russian soil, uh, begin to liberate Poland, uh, and start to sweep through the Baltics and the Balkans. So uh, uh, clearly then this advance, this driving westward, and these are several maps, again, just, you know, you can kind of take a look at them, which uh, I think are military maps, and they will, they will show these offensives uh, throughout uh, uh, 44. And you can kind of see, you know, if you look at them in sequence, I mean, this is the last of the five. And, you know, you could just see from those arrows, just, you know, the, the Russian advance is, is, is really quite staggering. This is, this is really, you know, kind of uh, uh, it in terms of um, uh, World War II. Okay, this all leads up to kind of the denouement, late 44 on. Uh, D-Day finally takes place. The second front is finally established, as you know, in June of 1944. That previous fall, in the fall of 43, Churchill and Roosevelt and Stalin met for the first time at Tehran. And they said, second front is our priority for 44. No, you know, everything else is secondary. Second front uh, is uh, uh, most important. Uh, uh, Roosevelt names Eisenhower as commander to plan for D-Day. Uh, they decide, of course, to attack through France. Um, I actually just used a, a tourist map of France was actually better than the D-Day maps I, I found. But uh, uh, obviously it's going to be a cross-channel invasion um, right here. They decide on, you know, kind of Normandy, the Normandy area, which is around, right around here. Here's uh, Omaha Beach. Um, uh, Normandy has good ports. They choose that for the invasion. Uh, it begins in August. Uh, uh, the Allies break out very shortly after that and begin marching westward. Uh, and again, this is uh, uh, kind of a military map of, of uh, the, uh, um, the second front, the, the, the cross-channel invasion. Uh, the Allies begin driving across France. Um, they link up with other forces uh, 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 coming in from the south. Uh, they start to liberate major cities, Toulouse, Marseille. Ultimately, they liberate Paris in late August of 44, begin to drive into Belgium. Remember, this is how the Germans started the war. Now the Allies are pushing them out. By mid-September, most of Belgium and Luxembourg were liberated. Uh, the Allies, however, not unusually in, in world warfare, start to to outrun their own supply lines, uh, so they have to kind of slow down uh, a little bit, which is going to lead to a, a brief, uh, a brief uh, um, German offensive, but really won't amount to anything. Uh, uh, the um, the, the Germans were battered by mid-1944. I mean, in the east, you know, they're getting crushed. As I said, I'm going through this really quickly, but you can look at the maps and get some indication of the advance. In the east, they're getting crushed. And now with the, the cross-channel invasion, the second front, and the liberation of France, you can see, you know, and, and the movements into, into Belgium and, and, and Luxembourg, that, that the Germans are also caught in a vice, right? They're getting it from both the east uh, and the west. And so uh, the Allies begin to close this vice. Um, the Russians are pouring through eastern uh, uh, Europe. Uh, they're clearing, uh, uh, fighting along with Yugoslavian partisans. The Yugoslav liberation, the underground was actually led by a communist, uh, 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 Tito, Joseph Braz, Tito, and Tito joins with the Russians and starts to fight. So uh, they clear uh, Belgrade, which is in Yugoslavia. They, they uh, liberate half of Hungary, move into eastern Czechoslovakia. By this time, the Red Army is leaving its forces in Eastern Europe, too, as they go through and liberate these areas. They continue to leave their forces there, which is obviously going to become an issue in the post-war, right? Uh, so they occupy uh, Poland and parts of East Prussia as well, so they're moving into Germany. Uh, uh, at the same time, uh, the Germans are also getting hit hard from the air. The Allied bombing campaign gains momentum. Um, the Allies drop 2.7 million tons of bombs on Germany. 2.7 million tons, 72% of that, uh, three-fourths of that almost, uh, you know, 2 million tons occurred in uh, uh, less than a year between July of 44 and May of 45 when the war ended. This was the most, you know, uh, intense bombing campaign up to Vietnam before Vietnam. 2 million 
2.7 million tons uh, in July. And it also, in addition to kind of hitting industrial centers and military installations, uh, the U.S. and the Allies begin what would you know be, have to be considered terror bombing campaigns. For instance, in uh, July and August of 43, the Allies hit Hamburg, which is a big shipping and industry center, but was also heavily populated. Uh, they used incendiary bombs. Incendiary bombs basically have napalm in them. So before they actually explode, the napalm is released. And when the bomb hits and creates an explosion, what happens? You know what napalm is? It's a gaseous gel. It creates firestorms. So this incendiary bombing uh, uh, was used against, you know, in civilian warfare. In late July of 43, over 700 planes from Bomber Command, which was the, the air war headquarters in World War II, hit Omberg. They set off massive firestorms and simply overwhelmed civil defense. Over 6,000 acres were wiped out. Over 300,000 homes burned. 750,000 people homeless. 60 to 100,000 dead. In February of 1940, Dresden was hit similarly with incendiary bombs and between 60 and 100,000 people in Dresden were killed. The point here is that Germany is just becoming overwhelmed by through 1944 into to 1945. In late 44, the Allies are still marching through France, trying to cross the Rhine into Germany. Hitler's situation is grim, but he's going to go down fighting. Uh, Hitler sees an opportunity in Luxembourg uh, uh, near the um, Ardennes, which is kind of what he did to begin the war. Um, over here, this is what we're talking about here. Um, uh, there's an opportunity, uh, um, as in 1940, uh, uh, Hitler sees kind of some weaknesses in the Allied lines. So he scrapes up the strategic reserve, 25 divisions, two panzer armies, hoping to break the line, move it to Belgium, and cut back into, uh, into uh, 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 France. Um, his own generals tend to tell him, look, you don't have the men and material to pull it off. He does it anyway. In mid-December of 1944, the Germans attack. This is the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, the opening drive took the Americans by uh, surprise, major intelligence failure. Um, the Germans uh, shattered two American divisions, finally were stopped at Bastogne and Malmedy. Uh, the Allies recovered um, and then just kind of began a very steady and inexorable move uh, toward um, toward uh, the, the West to push Germany back to to the eastward. We're, we're going from the west to the east now. Uh, uh, as a result, this, this, in, involved, this engagement in December was devastating. Hitler lost over 200,000 men and 600 tanks and pretty much the entire air force, so very little left. The Russians are opening huge holes in the east. By early 45, the Red Army has an 11 to 1 advantage in manpower, a 7 to 1 advantage in tanks, and a 20 to 1 advantage in artillery and aircraft. So this vice is closing, you know, really crushing the Germans. Um, in January, the Red Army begins offensives, and the Russians sprint uh, throughout Eastern Europe from Vistula to the Oder River in Poland. Uh, they're only 50 miles from Berlin. They clear Prussia. They took the Danzig Corridor in Poland. They occupied Pomerania. They take Budapest and they liberate Vienna. In the west, Eisenhower finally drives through the upper Rhine region. It's kind of like an avalanche in both the east and western front. They bust through the Rhine. The Germans are crushed. The Allies overrun the Ruhr Valley. They drive on to Berlin. Um, the Americans and Russians meet at the Elba River, and they go into uh, uh, Berlin together on May 8th, and the Germans surrender, and the war in Europe is concluded with uh, devastating uh, uh, efficiency uh, toward the end. Um, the Red Army ultimately uh, uh, wiped out the Wehrmacht. 80% um, of Germans' losses 80% of their casualties, of their deaths, of soldiers' deaths, of, of uh, 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 you know, damage inflicted was caused by the Red Army as it moved through the East. By the time the Second Front was finally established, which clearly was important, the Germans were already in desperate condition. Uh, uh, the, uh, 
uh, the Second Front clearly facilitated the end of the war. There's no question about that. But at the same time, Germany was already, you know, past the point of recovery as a result of what had happened in the in the battle uh, in the East. So the Soviet Union liberated Eastern Europe. Now, what we'll see in the Cold War in the post-war period is that becomes a major crisis because they maintain liberation after liberation they maintain areas uh, armies of, of occupation in Eastern Europe. All right. So um, we will kind of pick that up. Any questions on this? I told you I was going fast. I'm actually kind of doing a pretty good job of it today. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about the Pacific. And if you thought I went through Europe fast, wait till you see this. Any, any questions on World War II? I think, you know, the, the stuff about the Second Front and this, I think what, what's really important for the post-war era is the, the delays in the Second Front and um, the Russian losses. Because in the post-war era, the Russians will constantly bring this up. Look what we lost. As I said, at the time, in the, in the immediate aftermath of the war, in general, um, the, the statistics indicated that about 20 or 25 million Russians were killed. Uh, in the past six months, and people have gone through these uh, records that no one had seen before, and they're thinking now the numbers could be even much bigger than that, could be in the 40 to 50 million range. At some point, the numbers are relevant. I mean, they were just, they, these are, are losses of staggering proportions. Uh, so clearly, I mean, this is going to be a major factor in Stalin's thinking after the war, just as the delays in the second front where he won't separate them. Okay, very quickly talk a little bit about the war in the Pacific. Um, we've already spent a little time on that. I have a link here to Outline 7, which is when we talked about it earlier. Uh, remember the uh, uh, Japanese invasions of Manchuria, where they established the puppet state of Manchukuo, and then the invasion of China in 1937, and the U.S. really doesn't do anything. Roosevelt wants to avoid war in Asia, um, uh, uh, refuses to take any big steps like an embargo of oil. Uh, the Japanese, however, find themselves in need of resources, so in 1940, they go into Southeast Asia, into the Dutch East Indies, into Indochina for oil. Um, in 1941, in July, they go into Indochina. Uh, at that point, Roosevelt finally stops trading with the Japanese, seizes their assets, and finally includes an oil embargo. And this leads to the attack on Pearl Harbor uh, in December of 1941, which drags the U.S. into the war. Uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor, you know, as we'll see very, very, very quickly, was was really uh, a counter, kind of pretty stupid, actually. It was a real strategic blunder. Um, Admiral Yamamoto, the head of the uh, Japanese Navy, said, uh, we'll run wild in the Pacific for six months, for a year. We'll do well. We'll have the initiative. After that, he said, and these are his words, I am utterly without confidence, meaning what's going to be the big factor as it was in Europe. It's not necessarily strategy or warfare. What's America's overwhelming advantage? logistics and also in, in, in production, right? And this is Yamamoto's thought, you know, uh, uh, once, uh, once it kicks in, once they start producing, you know, aircraft carriers and planes and, and you know, fighters, it's, it's over. Um, even though the United States has a European first approach, and you know, that makes a great deal of sense, Asia is very critical uh, to American interest. Uh, Asian nations furnished over 50% of America's pre-war raw and crude materials that were imported into the U.S., all right? uh, with the exception of oil, of course, most raw and crude materials, uh, not most, but many, actually most, come from Asia. Uh, for instance, the, uh, uh, the Dutch East Indies, Indonesia, and British Malaya supplied 86% um, of the crude rubber and 87% of the tin that the United States imported. Uh, Asian countries produced 85% of the tungsten imported into the U.S., one-third of the mica, which is important for like insulation and, and electrical equipment, 99% uh, of the jute, which is used for, for cords and sacks and things like that, 98% of shellac, varnishes and sealants. All of those come to the United States. 80 to 90% of it is imported from Asia. Um, so it's an incredibly important area to the U.S. They, in addition to that, as we've talked about before, you know, the open door really is about Asia. It's about China in particular. Um, the war itself, World War II, is going to be principally a sea war. Japan is not a huge country. It doesn't have a huge army. Most of its army is in China. So the war itself is going to be a, uh, a war uh, on the sea and uh, with a lot of carrier-based aviation. Um, as I said, uh, okay, we'll, we'll get there sooner or later. 
Um, this is uh, this is a map of the war in the Pacific. Um, actually, the other one I think is probably better now that I think about it. Yeah, this is one I showed you before. <clears throat> this yellow line here is the extent of uh, Japanese uh, expansion into 1941 and 42. After Pearl Harbor, the Japanese kind of uh, 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 move into the Pacific and take all of these areas, probably the most important of which were like Guam, Wake Island, and the Philippines. Uh, and this was the Japanese advance from December 7th, 1941 till mid-42. And you see this really uh, uh, a significant expansion into the Pacific as well as these areas where they control French Indochina and uh, the, the Indies and, and, and uh, Manchukuo, all right? Uh, Japan uh, moves out further than that. However, beginning in mid-1942, you start to see an American reversal um, in several sea battles. Uh, at Coral Sea, the U.S. actually uh, used air power to make a difference. In, in fact, even uh, uh, sent bombing raids uh, into Japan at Tokyo. And then in Midway, which was really a turning point, um, the uh, Pacific Fleet, uh, I think under the command of Nimitz, if I'm not mistaken, Admiral Chester Nimitz, uh, takes ta uh, defeats the J J Japanese. It's the first clear-cut victory. And um, just as Hitler was hoping for a short war in the East, the Japanese were Hoping. That was the really only hope, a short war. Knock the Americans out, hit them with some staggering blows early on, like Pearl Harbor, uh, so they'll have to withdraw, so they'll have to retreat. Okay? Once the U.S. reverses, first at the Coral Sea, then more importantly at Midway, it's clear that's not going to happen. The United States then begins a really big buildup in the Pacific. Uh, it's fighting this two-theater war, which you can imagine the industrial production needed for that. Um, in 1942, 43, 44, the American offensive picks up momentum. The Japanese are in retreat, beginning, uh, thus begins the, the so-called island hopping campaigns where the U.S. begins to liberate these small uh, uh, areas. Uh, in 1944, the United States liberates uh, the, the Philippines. It retakes the Philippines. Remember from MacArthur's famous, I shall return. MacArthur was the commander in, in, in the Philippines. And, uh, you know, when the Japanese uh, uh, occupy it, MacArthur leaves and, you know, this famous, I shall return. And everybody's kind of all poignant because, you know, he wants to defend the Philippines. Actually, MacArthur was the biggest landholder in the Philippines. He was a land speculator. And so when he said, I shall return, it was because he... He was wealthy, and he needed to get back to his stuff. He was a, he was a very odd man. Um, MacArthur, Franklin Roosevelt considered him the most dangerous man in America. Roosevelt thought that if there was ever like a military coup, it would be led by MacArthur. Uh, psycho historians, you know, kind of the, the people who study the mind are also intrigued by the fact that when he got his commission to West Point, uh, his mother moved there with him, and he lived with her for those four years. And uh, so I, I don't know. I, that kind of stuff doesn't do a whole lot for me, but it's anything I have I'll use against the guy, so, you know. Um, in 1944 then and into 45, the United States begins to go for the outlying islands, especially uh, Iwo Jima and Okinawa. Uh, Okinawa is, uh, I think, the closest of the outlying islands from the Japanese homeland. And in early 1945, uh, the United States finally, and these are brutal battles, Iwo Jima and Okinawa, really brutal, bloody uh, battles. Uh, the war in the Pacific, and I, I you know, I've got so much else to do, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Um, but, but it, it, you know, it, there's kind of a stereotype that, that's revolved around it, especially with regard to the Japanese, the Bataan Death March and so forth. Uh, but this actually takes place on both sides. There's some really good stuff on it. The best is a, a book written uh, 10 or 15 years ago by, by a historian named John Dower, and it's called War Without Mercy. And basically, you know, what you see from this is that, that, that the war in the Pacific has elements of race war as well. I mean, it's clearly a war for the open door. It's a war for resources, but among soldiers, among those actually fighting, it has elements of, of kind of great racial theories and antagonisms behind it. Um, and so it's really brutal. Uh, I mean, you know, you have it kind of, you know, what we see in Iraq today, beheadings, people cutting their ears off and wearing necklaces uh, with them. Uh, American propaganda uh, portrays the Japanese like as monkeys or as lice. Uh, the Americans put out a lot of propaganda films. In fact, uh, 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 the, the great director Frank Capra actually produced a series called Why We Fight, which is American propaganda. And one of his uh, writers on the Why We Fight series was a guy named Theodore Gazelle. Name sound familiar? 
Dr. Seuss. Dr. Seuss started by doing uh, anti-Japanese propaganda in World War II. He later became a, an outspoken peacenik and things like that. Um, so the war itself was really brutal. I mean, uh, uh, the, the death marches and the atrocities. So it's, it's uh, uh, and Okinawa and, and Iwo Jima and Okinawa are really, you know, really kind of to the point where it's hand-to-hand -hand combat in a lot of areas. Uh, the U.S. finally uh, uh, subdues the Japanese, and after that, all that's left is an invasion of the home island, right? But that doesn't happen, okay? That doesn't happen. The war ends in August, and how does it end? The atomic bomb, okay? I have some spacing problems on this. I'm sorry about that. Um, I, I normally don't do this, go into things in such detail, but, but this one I do. I think uh, there are several case studies, if you want to call them that, which indicate not only how history is done, but how we look at history and how important history is and how politically charged history can be, how it can serve the interest of a particular group of people. Orwell once said, whoever controls the past controls the present, and whoever controls the present controls the future. I think I may have said that the first class. If I didn't, you know, I, I should have. Um, the point being that if you can control the past and suggest that something happened in a particular way and then justify your actions based on that and have people believe it, then you will have control not only of the present but of the future. It would be, let's say, pick something out of the air, convincing people that, you know, Iraq was responsible for 911 and have weapons of mass destruction and therefore had to be invaded, right? If you can make people believe that, then you can get away with what you want. If they continue to believe that, then you can continue to stay in power. If they realize that you may have been deceptive, then that monkey wrenches the whole thing, all right? I say this by way of introduction to talk about the atomic bombing because this is uh, uh, an incredible case study, not only of the way power operates, but the way we learn history. So it has a twofold uh, mission here. Um, much of this comes from uh, an amazing book, one of my best, most impressive history books I've ever seen called uh, uh, um, The Decision to Use the Atomic Bomb. It's, it's by a guy named Gar Alperovitz. And he's been writing about this stuff for, oh, I guess 40 years now. His first book was like 1965. He's written several things on this, but the most, you know, kind of the culmination of a lifetime came in the, the mid 90s, 96, 97. It's called The Decision to Use the Atomic Bomb. And it's about 800 pages, but it's actually two books. And he even labels them book one, book two. Book one is all about the decision to use the atomic bomb. Book two is called The Architecture of a Myth. All right. And, and ultimately, that's to me more important because. What Alperovitz found in book one about the decision to use the bomb did not corroborate with the myth that has been devised since then. So I want to do a little bit of this. All right, why was the atomic bomb dropped? Why was the atomic bomb dropped? What's the general line? What, what do you, you know? To save a million. To save a exactly, bingo. Were you in my class? Were you in my survey? No, I'm, I'm kidding. What? Oh, no, I was, I was kidding, really, but that's exactly it. That's the answer, right? To save a million American lives. Oh, okay, cool. Great, thanks. Table mics work, so you just push it down so they can hear you. All right, the atomic bomb was dropped in order to avoid having to invade Japan and save a million Americans. That's exactly it. Who said that? Truman said that, right? Okay, it's got to be true, okay? So this is what people believe, all right? Let's talk a little bit about the bomb and the history of the bomb, okay? The atomic bomb was a product of the Manhattan Project, which got started pretty much as soon as World War II began, right? The Manhattan Project was this super secret uh, a project from, uh, with American and British, the British know about this, British scientists, headed by General Leslie Groves and an amazing group of scientists, Fermi, Oppenheimer, Teller, you know, Niels Bohr, Feynman, you name it. It was kind of the, the rock and roll, you know, the rock stars of the physics world were all in, uh, involved in the Manhattan Project. And uh, Oppenheimer is really fascinating if, if you ever want to you know, read a, a, an incredible biography of a guy who combines science and politics and everything else. Oppenheimer and Bohr was the same way. Einstein peripherally involved, okay? Um, so the Manhattan Project is established with an amazing budget and their goal is of course to develop atomic weapons because clearly the Germans have been working on that. How do we know? Because most of the scientists in the Manhattan Project were Germans. They had fled, a lot of them were Jewish, a lot of them had fled Nazi Germany. A bunch of them went to the U.S., a bunch of them went to the Soviet Union. So the Soviet and American bomb projects, you know, uh, were really uh, uh, in large measure staffed by refugees from the Axis. Fermi was Italian, so you see a lot of that. Um, 
1944 and 1945, they're close. They're getting closer and closer to developing an atomic bomb. But I want to talk a little bit about the foreign policy aspects of it, okay? February of 1945. The war in Asia has definitely reversed, and we just very, very quickly went through that. But Iwo Jima and Okinawa are American victories, and they come at a great cost to the Japanese. Okay? In addition to that, in February of 1945, and we'll talk about this again later, there's a major conference at Yalta. And at Yalta, the Soviet Union, the British, and the Americans get together, and they talk about a lot of things, which we'll talk about later. But one of the things they talk about is the war in the Pacific. And at Yalta, the Soviet Union agrees that it will come in to the war against Japan precisely three months after the war ends in Europe. So three months after the war in Europe ends, the Soviet Union agrees that it will go into uh, uh, Japan and fight against the Japanese because they haven't been fighting against them. So keep that in mind. At the same time, in the spring of 1945, American military planners are thinking about Asia. You don't just like wake up one day and say, let's go fight a war. So they're planning. American military planners are developing their uh, uh, war plans for for a, a, a coming major battle against the Japanese. And they have several assumptions there. But one of the most important is that American military planners are assuming that Japan is on its heels and ready to surrender. They expect the Japanese surrender. They understand that Japan is deeply, deeply hurt. And they are assuming that a simple Soviet declaration of war without an invasion, just as soon as the Soviet Union declares war in Japan, they expect Japan to surrender. So the assumption there is that Japan is really in, de in deep, desperate shape and will probably surrender uh, uh, very shortly. In addition to that, U.S. planners are developing scenarios for casualties. If you've ever read, and I've read them for Vietnam, tons of them, planning reports, they assume, and they're very detailed, we can expect this, this, this. We can expect this many casualties. We can expect this many dead. We can expect this many hurt. So they're very much definite and to the point. In the spring of 1945, American military planners in developing these very intricate and detailed war plans for Japan are basing their casualty assumptions on the idea that 25,000 Americans will die at most. 25,000 casualties. Casualties don't have to be deaths. They can be you know, wounded as well. So the casualty figures coming out of the American military command, right? Not some wacko professor. American military commanders in World War II, planners under the you know, overall general direction of George Marshall, are assuming that 25,000 casualties will occur in an invasion of Japan. In addition to that, in the spring and summer of 1945, the Japanese begin to make overtures. They begin to say, things aren't going well, we need to end this thing quickly. They go through the Soviet Union. They make connections with Soviet diplomats, and they begin doing these kind of back-channel talks with the Soviet Union. All right? They have one major condition. Uh, early in the war, Roosevelt and Churchill announced the policy of unconditional surrender. You surrender, no conditions, and we'll take care of you in a way we see fit. Well, Japan has one condition at once in unconditional surrender. Does anybody know what that was? Keep the end. Retain Hirohito, who's, you know, a, a, a sun god, right? So the Japanese have one major condition. We want to retain the imperial system. We want to retain the emperor, more or less, as a figurehead. All right. At the same time, these American planners who have s estimated so far, uh, they come up with three major findings. One, they expect Japan to surrender. Two, they expect 25,000 casualties. Three, they estimate that the earliest date at which they could uh, uh, invade in a limited basis, invade Japan, would be November 1st, 1945. Okay, this would be a limited invasion of the outlying islands. And the first, the earliest date at which they could have a full invasion of the uh, um, Japanese mainland would be 1 January 1946. All right. So these, the, this is the planning. All right. Amid this, in July of 1945, I know I'm talking about a lot of stuff, but that's all right. Uh, and if you remind me, I'll put a link on the web page, an article I wrote about this, a brief article I wrote about this a couple years ago, which explains all this stuff. Uh, in, in July of 1945, uh, uh, the U.S. was planning on having another high-level meeting. Uh, by now, Roosevelt is dead. He dies in February, uh, I'm sorry, April of 45, and Harry Truman's president. So Truman and Churchill and Stalin are planning on meeting in July of 1945 at Potsdam. 
They were supposed to meet early in the month, but Truman kept delaying. You know, I need more time. I have budget concerns. Now, clearly, the budget isn't as important as the war, but he keeps stalling. Okay? Finally, in mid-July, they meet at Potsdam. The first day there, I mean, within 24 hours of arriving in Potsdam, uh, Harry Truman's Secretary of State, James Burns, comes up and whispers in his ear and tells him something very important, that at Alamogordo, New Mexico, there's been a successful test of the atomic bomb. And uh, all accounts suggest that at that point, Truman's attitude changed tremendously. He had been very nervous. He's the senator from uh, uh, Missouri, didn't know a whole lot about the world. He was very nervous and anxious and somewhat insecure. And basically after that, people said he walked around like he was carrying the bomb on his hip, kind of like thrusting his pelvis and, you know, smoking a big cigar and, you know, kind of acting like, you know, Schwarzenegger or something like that, you know. Uh, so he's, his attitude changes. You know, and, and, and he starts to become like very aggressive and, and you know, very, you know, kind of uh, demanding uh, at that point. OK, uh, he's now aware that the, the, the bomb has been uh, tested successfully. Now, based on the decision made at Yalta to enter the war against the Japanese, the Soviet Union is looking at some dates. The war in Europe ended on May 8th. Remember, I told you that a few minutes ago. Okay, if you're going to enter the war three months after that, what date are you looking at? Do the math, August 8th. So tentatively, you kind of figure that the Soviet Union is going to enter the war against Japan on August 8th. Now, if the Soviet Union goes uh, into the war as a combatant against the Japanese, what does that mean? Once the war ends, the Soviet Union will have played a part in defeating the Japanese, which gives them what? Access or title to what? part of the spoils, meaning especially trade, the open door, right? All right. Now, and this is kind of, you know, uh, now, now we can kind of piece it all together based on what we know so far, uh, the expectation of a Japanese um, a surrender, uh, the invasion dates of November and then January of 46, uh, the projected Soviet intervention uh, uh, in August of 1945, what happens on August 6th prior to the anticipated Soviet entry into the war against Japan, what does the U.S. do? It drops the first atomic bomb on Hiroshima, Nagasaki, three days later. All right. Now, this chronology calls into question a lot of the justification, right? Uh, 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 was an invasion imminent? No. A limited invasion wasn't even uh, possible until November, uh, late November, or I'm sorry, November 1st, which, you know, uh, gives them all of August, September, and October, basically two and a half months. So if you're really concerned about saving lives, you have two and a half months to build up, to engage in diplomacy, whatever. The bomb was dropped on August 6th, whereas it probably could have been dropped on, what, October 30th, if you want to, you know, kind of look at it and break it down that way, or even more on December 31st, right? You know, you can play all kinds of, of, of of games with the calendar uh, uh, on this one didn't happen that way all right so that's and just kind of keep this and you, you're not going to forget it and there's some images there of Hiroshima you've probably seen them before uh, but the damage is done I mean the, the real issue uh, about Hiroshima in terms of number killed it's probably no more damning than the attacks on Dresden or, or even Tokyo the air attacks uh, but clearly it ushers in a whole new form of warfare because this is one bomb doing this you know uh, not um, and this is Hiroshima reduced to rubble. Um, there's a documentary that came out last year about Bob McNamara. It's called Fog of War. I don't know if any of you have ever seen it. But it's about Bob McNamara in Vietnam, which I had real issues with. But I think the most impressive part of the, of the documentary was actually McNamara was part of the strategic bombing survey in World War II. And they had images of Japan after World War II. And uh, uh, the, the, the damage was really devastating. It was really staggering. So uh, clearly atomic warfare, and here's, this is very difficult. This is an, an image of a, a burn victim. So, I mean, clearly on, on so many different levels, it's just a, a, an entirely new way of engaging in warfare where you can actually blow up the world, you know, with, with, with a bomb, with, with a, you know, a, a few weapons, you know. So um, that's important. Okay, in addition to that, though, and this is the second part of Alperovitz's book. When the bomb was dropped, and for a period thereafter, there was no jubilation. 
most Americans were kind of ambivalent about it, clearly glad that the war was over, undoubtedly glad the war was over. But if you look at public opinion polls, 1945, 1946, into 1947, the Americans are deeply divided over whether the atomic bomb should have been used. Almost every single military man, including Curtis LeMay, and if you know anything about LeMay, he was considered a nut, you know. He's the guy who wanted to blow Vietnam back to the Stone Age. LeMay was against it. Eisenhower was against it. Leahy was against it. Virtually every American military commander in World War II was against using the atomic bomb against Japan. Right? Why? Because they didn't need to. It would create grave problems, grave post-war problems, create animosities, lead to an escalating arms race. All the scientists were against it too. Scientists actually sent a petition to Roosevelt and Churchill saying, don't use the atomic bomb. If you want to use it, just have a test demonstration in the Pacific, invite the Japanese there, blow it up in the ocean and say, this is going to happen to you if you, surrender, if you don't surrender. This is the scientist's recommendation. Scientists, the guys who invented the bomb, the military guys, the guys who were going to use it, most, almost all of them were against it. Nonetheless, it was dropped. All right? Deep ambivalence. The National Council of Churches actually passed a resolution criticizing the use of the atomic bomb. William Buckley Sr., William Buckley's father, who was at the time, you know, like his son, a major conservative commentator, actually wrote articles very critical of it. Conservative and liberal, like Henry Wallace, who was a leftist, criticized it. A wide uh, block of people opposed to this, really deeply concerned by it, thinking that it wasn't good judgment. Yeah? Why did they drop the second one? That's a good question. And, and, and uh, there's another argument. Right. Alperovitz's argument is going to be called atomic diplomacy. And Alperovitz is basically going to say that the US dropped a bomb as a signal to the Russians. So you ever remember old Saturday Night Live with Mike Myers, Coffee Talk? And one time, you know how he always gives them a topic. And one of the topics was the atomic bomb. Did Truman drop it to end the war or scare the Russians? Talk amongst yourselves. That's actually the issue. And Alperovitz is suggesting that the, the atomic bomb was atomic diplomacy. It was directed not at Japan, but at the Soviet Union. It, yeah, well, what I'm saying is the other argument on that is called the momentum argument, which basically says you got them, you use them. You don't spend zillions of dollars and, you know. I mean, the, the, the Japanese did not surrender after the first bomb. So basically the thing, well, you know. I, I don't, I mean, you know, if, if you want to put a moral tincture on this, which is always dangerous, the second bomb, I, I don't see how it's justified. I don't, I, mean, I don't think the first one was, but the second one is really hard to, um, it was just, let's end the war, we've got it, kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but into, for a couple years after that, there really was this sense that, 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 that the bomb didn't have to be used. But, getting to the point where we began this whole thing, uh, uh, Truman's running for re-election in 1948. Uh, there's a deep ambivalence. He wants to kind of uh, have this mantle of being, you know, the guy who led the U.S. to victory in World War II. And so his, one of the kind of grand old men of American diplomacy is Henry Stimson. And Stimson has, I believe, a son-in-law named McGeorge Bundy. Anybody ever heard of McGeorge Bundy? McGeorge Bundy was the National Security Advisor in Vietnam. I think it was McGeorge, it may have been his brother William, who's the Secretary of State. One of the Bundy brothers uh, is a son-in-law of Stimson. So they basically write an article, which they put in, I believe, Harper's Magazine, it may have been The Atlantic, it's one of the, one of the magazines at the time. And in it, Stimson, basically writing for Truman, says, I, it was the hardest decision I ever had to make, I agonized over it, but in the end, it really wasn't that difficult because I saved a million American lives, all right? Why, why a million? Because that's an impressive number, isn't it? I, I saved 742,312 American lives. Doesn't sound as good. I saved a million American lives. They basically created it. They, it was, and that's why, uh, why uh, um, Al Paravid's titles, the second part, The Architecture of a Myth. They created this idea that they had to drop the atomic bomb in order to forestall this invasion, which would have cost a million American lives. Now, it's really hard to say, you know, we're more concerned about the Japanese being victims of the atomic bomb than having, a, you know, a million Americans killed. You couldn't say that. You couldn't say, I don't really care if a million Americans are going to die. I just don't want the Japanese hurt. No one could say that, right? You just can't. It's all kinds of, you know, uh, it's, you know, kind of pregnant with all kinds of implications, you know, sociological and anthropological and everything else, cultural, yeah. I was uh, just coming up, we were always told to think of history as his story. His story. His, his, so it's, his, his, his story, so his story might not be the same as the other person's story. So right, but, yeah. but, but and, and that's why this, you know, I think this is really so important because Truman writes that and people believe it. 
And from 1948 onward, every single public opinion poll has shown well over 80% into the 90% range of people saying, yes, it was a good idea. The bomb should have been dropped. Why? Because it saved a million American lives. All right? Now, what this has done, all right, first of all, uh, several things. One, I mean, it indicates the way people in power operate. That uh, if you believe this, I'm convinced by it. Doesn't mean you have to be. Most people aren't. I'm in a minority of 10 to 15 percent, right? Although I will think I do. I would suggest that most people now who study this closely, historians, political scientists who study this, basically are accepting this idea. I mean, it's not really considered radical anymore. When it came out, it was considered wild. Uh, the first person actually to suggest this was one of the physicists involved in the nuclear project, PMS Blackett, in the late 40s. He said, you know. We, we didn't need to drop this. This was to send a message to the Soviet Union. I suspect Bohr and Oppenheimer and Einstein probably all felt the same way. Uh, uh, but Alperovitz writes the first book on this in 65 <clears throat> called Atomic Diplomacy. And he's considered a nut. I mean, he's just like, uh, you know, he's a communist, he's anti-American, you know, everything else. I think now it's actually among specialists considered somewhat of a mainstream uh, argument. But the point here is that if you believe this, what you're saying is that Truman was willing to, to sacrifice these Japanese and to destroy Hiroshima, basically to send a message to the USSR. We don't want you in Asia. This is our area of influence. We will maintain the open door here. And beyond that, you don't have one of these things. We do. We have an atomic monopoly, which means that in the post-war period, don't screw with us, all right? Don't mess with us because we got them. We know how to build them. You don't have them yet. A lot of the Americans didn't think the Soviet Union would have a bomb for a long time. You know, they just didn't, you know, they, there's no way. In fact, they got it five year, uh, what, four or five years later. They, they tested an atomic bomb and then the hydrogen bomb, they got it virtually the same time, uh, 52, 53, I can't remember. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they figured it, at the earliest a decade, perhaps even more. Part of it was just this kind of, you know, arrogance. But in fact, I mean, th their scientists were refugees from the same institutes that the American scientists were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Werner von Braun, yeah, he was a Nazi refugee. There's a really funny song about him from Tom Lehrer, if you've ever heard it. Uh, what is it? In German and Russian, I know how to count down. Now I'm learning Chinese, says Werner von Braun. It's 10, 9, 8. It's, it's funny stuff. Anyway. Um, uh, 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 so, so I think, you know, from, from the uh, perspective of learning about history, um, this is really a wonderful case study because to this day, not only do most people not know this, but in fact they are, you know, intentionally and objectively kept from learning this story. And I'll, I'll finish here before our break. In the, in the mid-90s, 93, 94, 95, the Smithsonian was planning a major exhibit on the 50th anniversary of the uh, Enola Gay, which is the, the plane that dropped the bombs. And so if you've ever been to the Smithsonian, the Air and Space Museum, really impressive place. They have, you know, missiles and airplanes and everything else. And they have a script next to it, which tells you the story, right? And sometimes it's very, you know, perfunctory. You know, this is an SS-20 missile. It's this big. It has this much of a payload, so on and so forth. But sometimes there's a story attached to it. So any script attached to the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki would, would clearly have a script attached to it. Um, there was a panel of historians who were overlooking this script. It was basically what the Smithsonian was going to say. And in this script, the Smithsonian, the Smithsonian's writers suggested that some people believe that the bomb was not militarily necessary. It was used as a message to the Soviet Union. They didn't say that's why it was used. They said some people believe this. And if, in fact, historians, of, some of whom I know, were very upset by how timid the script was because they thought it should have actually said this is probably why it was used. There's no way the Smithsonian was going to say that. Nonetheless, some people got, got wind of, of the script suggesting that atomic diplomacy may have been a factor. People like Newt Gingrich, Democrats, Air Force Association, you know, all across the spectrum, liberal Democrats, conservative Republicans, everybody, they got wind of this and they went nuts and they basically hammered the Smithsonian, put their foot down and said, you can't do that. You can't even suggest, not that they were saying this was the truth. They were suggesting this is one way of looking at it. And basically these people said, you can't suggest that. We're not going to let you. You can't even put this idea out there that the atomic bomb wasn't necessary. We did it to save all these American lives and the Japanese had it coming. That's the only story you're allowed to tell. Okay. 
the exhibit, after all this time and energy and money was pumped, it was finally canceled. And from that point on, the Smithsonian is afraid to take on. They were going to have a Vietnam exhibit. They killed it at that point. They just killed it. They said, there's no, if we can't do the atomic bomb, there's no way we're going to be able to do Vietnam, right? So this is what's really important about history. It was rewritten in the late 40s. You can, if you want to justify the atomic bomb, you do it. I mean, you know, that's everybody's decision to make. There's, and you can do it on a lot of grounds. It doesn't matter if it's something. You can say, I don't care if they saved one life. It was worth it, right? Uh, 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 you know, or, or you can even say, you know, say, well, hey, sending a message to the Soviet Union is not a bad idea. It's justified on that alone. You, you can make those arguments, right? But the point here is that the history was revised in order to suit a particular political agenda. And since that point, it's been taught a certain way. I get textbooks all the time. You know, there's always a zillion textbooks coming out. They always send you free copies, hoping you'll adopt them. And um, Basically, the first thing I look for is the way the atomic bomb is taught, because that's a good indicator of, of what the book, I think, is going to be like. And these are professional historians, and most of them are still very timid uh, on this issue. So uh, uh, it's really interesting to see the way that history can satisfy a particular political agenda. I think what we saw in the recent years with the, the ramp up in Iraq, you know, terrorism and Al-Qaeda in Iraq and weapons of mass destruction fits this pattern very well. If you can control the past and create a history that people will believe, and if you can continue to have them believe that, then it will justify what you do because you're protecting them against that particular threat, which means that you retain power. And that's clearly, I think, part of what's happened with the atomic bomb. And that's one reason I spend more time on this than any single item in the entire course. I don't think there's any single issue that I will spend as much time on in, in, in detail as I do on this one, because it's really a great case study. And it's also indicative of the way power was used and the way that these guys are going to reconstruct the post-war world. You want an open door in Japan. You want access to the Pacific. You want to send a message to the Soviet Union not to mess with us. How do you do it? Boom, drop a couple bombs. Everybody gets the, you know, that gets everybody's attention. All right? Take a break and then we'll uh, pick up.